When I was studying land law, I often found the idea of freehold covenants to be quite difficult to get my head around. And I think the reason for that is because there are just so many variables involved. We have the idea of a covenantor and a covenantee, also the ideas of common law and equity being distinct, and also the different types of covenants, so positive covenants and negative covenants as well. In this lecture, we're going to try and explore all of those in detail and hopefully help you to combine them ahead of any coursework or exam. So with that in mind, let's get started. As I mentioned in the introduction, the first thing that we want to do is distinguish the different types of people involved. And this will be especially important in a problem type scenario. So in this situation, we have a woman who is the landowner and often in most circumstances, she will decide to sell off part of her land to someone else, the gentleman in this case. So that gentleman then is the owner of the freehold title. But as part of that transaction, there may be a covenant or a promise that's involved. So in this situation, we have the woman telling the man, I'll sell you this piece of land. But as a part of that, you're going to have to mow my lawn. So the man in this situation is the covenantor or the promisor, the person who is making the promise to the landowner, and they are seen as having the burden of the covenant. Obviously, then he mows this lady's lawn and the lady is regarded as the covenantee. She gets the benefit, which in this circumstance would just be having her lawn mowed. So that's the basic idea behind it. But one of the key questions is what happens when one of the original owners moves on? And this is the sort of circumstance that will often come up in a problem question. And it's the idea of covenants running with the land and in particular, the benefit of a covenant or the burden of a covenant and how that can run. So to do this, we have to look at the distinction between common law and equity. Now, in common law, we have the idea of privity of contract. In other words, if I make a contract with another person, then that contract is just between me and that person. So if another person gets involved, say uh, someone else who takes over the land, then the basic idea is that they should not be bound by a contract that I have made with a, another person. So with this in mind, the burden generally does not pass in common law. And we can look at the case of Osterbury and Corporation of Oldham for that. However, the benefit can generally pass in common law, and the case for this is Smith and Snipes Hall Farm Limited and River Douglas Catchment Board in 1947. So that distinction is already coming into play between the burden and the benefit, especially in common law. However, we do also have to look at equity, and the main case in this area is the case of Tolkien Moxhay in 1843. And the picture I've put there is of Leicester Square in London because this case concerned a covenant in Leicester Square saying that you couldn't build anything in Leicester Square. Um, and it was held in this case that the burden can actually pass as the purchaser will have notice of it. Obviously, the courts didn't want people randomly building stuff in the middle of Leicester Square. And so that burden was allowed to pass. And we'll talk about notice in a little bit. But the problem with Tolkien Moxhay was that this was very broad, the idea that all burdens and all covenants um, should be able to pass. And so another distinction had to be made. Um, and we will look at this now. And that's the, dis the distinction between positive and negative covenants. So a positive covenant is that the covenantor has to actively do something, often involves the paying of money, but it might not necessarily be that. So we saw the example of mowing my lawn at the very start. That would be a positive covenant because the person has to actively do something. A negative or a restrictive covenant, on the other hand, is where you're preventing someone from doing something. So the idea that you um, shouldn't build on the land, as we saw in Tolkien Moxhay. So let's have a look at these positive covenants first, where someone actually has to do something. And the burden of a positive covenant cannot pass in common law, and it only passes in equity in very specific um, circumstances. And these are the circumstances in Holsall and Brazil in 1957. And we're looking here for reciprocal burdens and benefits. 
So you might imagine that if you live on a housing estate, for example, there might be a covenant in place where you have to pay for the upkeep of, say, a road. Now, obviously, that's a positive covenant because you're having to pay money for the upkeep of the road. But you're also getting a benefit out of it as well, because the road is being maintained and you are probably using that road in some way. And so uh, even there is a reciprocal burden and also a benefit as well. However, there's no effect where the owner has no choice whether to accept the burden. And this really limits the effect of the case of Holsall and Brazil. That comes from Lord Templeman in Roan and Stevens back in 1994. So these circumstances surround the um, burden passing on in a positive covenant in equity is really actually quite limited. However, there has been some debate about whether it should be expanded, and this is often the sort of thing that will come up in an essay question in this area. And for that, we can look at a Law Commission report that was put out in 2011 that talked about replacing the idea of covenants with more about the idea of general land obligations. So if that's something that you think might come up in your exam, I definitely recommend going away and looking at that Law Commission report. So negative covenants is probably where the main thing comes in. And in equity, several requirements have to be met for the burden to actually be transferred. So we're talking about the burden in relation to negative covenants um, in equity. However, these um, criteria are actually quite easily satisfied. And so the burden in equity can actually be transferred relatively easily. So let's have a look at those. The covenant must touch and concern the land. Well, that's true of most covenants. It does have to concern the land. It's not really a covenant whatsoever if it's a personal obligation. So how about if in our original example, the person had said, instead of mowing my lawn, you have to do my shopping for me. Well, that's not really related to the land in any way. And so it's a personal um, obligation rather than a, a freehold covenant as we would describe it. There also has to be proximity. So the dominant land has to actually be able to benefit. Again, relatively easily satisfied in most cases. We can look at Kelly and Barrett as the case for that. There also has to be an intention for the burden to actually run with the land. That's presumed, though, by Section 79 of the Law of Property Act 1925. It is possible to go against that intention, but generally speaking, that intention is presumed. And finally, the covenant does actually have to be registered. So we talked earlier about the idea of a person having notice of the covenant. And for unregistered land, that's simply done through a class D2 land charge. And in most circumstances nowadays, it's going to be in relation to registered land. And so we're just registering a notice on the title under sections 32 and 33 of the Land Registration Act 2002. So that's the burden passing, and we see that that's relatively straightforward and not too problematic. Um, the benefit of a ne negative covenant can run, and that only applies in three particular situations. So we're going to have a look at those now. The first of the these is annexation, which is possibly the most common. And this is the idea that the benefit is permanently attached to the land. So it doesn't matter who the owner is they will always get the benefit of it because it's annexed to the land itself. It's associated with the land. So the, the case law in this area used to be a little bit confusing, but it was tidied up a lot by the Federated Homes case, which basically interpreted Section 79 of the Law of Property Act 1925, so that if the covenant touched the land and the dominant land was identified, then the annexation would be automatic. So we've got two criteria there for annexation, but once they're met, we have this permanent attachment between the covenant and the land. Next time that a, a benefit can actually be transferred is assignment, and this is not too different from annexation. Um, and it's basically, if the covenant has not been annexed when it was created, then it can be expressly assigned to the land um, at a later date. Um, so the conveyance and the assignment of the covenant to a particular land must be simultaneous. We've got reunion of London case for that. Um, but once that assignment occurs, it effectively acts in the same way as an annexation of the covenant and the land. So there's that permanent association between the two.
Finally, we have schemes of development, and this is where you might sell off a plot of land in order to build a lot of houses. Say, for example, a housing estate might be the most common one. And in this particular circumstances, you're effectively having a covenant or a benefit of a covenant that runs right across the housing estate. And in order for that to occur, there are two criteria again. So the area must be properly identified. So we have to clearly delineate where the housing estate is and also the intention of reciprocal enforcement of obligations as well. So in the same way that we talked earlier about if we're maintaining a road on a housing estate and everyone is getting the benefit of that, then we have that recipro reciprocal enforcement of obligations. So before we finish, we also have to talk about third party rights as well. At the moment, we've really just talked about the relationship between the covenant or and the covenantee. And so we can see that on the example here where the covenantee has clearly sold off part of their land and the covenantor has got that land now or has the freehold title to it but has made promises to the covenantee. But what about people who might be affected who are not within those um, that direct relationship but might have land which is next door, as we see here with the third party? Well, Section 56 of the Law of Property Act enables a person who is not party to a covenant to sue upon it where, firstly, the covenant purports to be made with that person, and we've got the case of Lias and Prowse developments for that, and the covenantee is clearly identifiable. And that doesn't necessarily having to mean having to name them, but that third party land has to be sort of clearly identified within the context of the covenant. So we've got re-ecclesiastical commissions for England's conveyance for that. One of the other main developments in this area in the past sort of 20 years or so has been the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act 1999. In particular, we have Section 1.3, which basically says that if the third party is not necessarily identifiable, they still can sue if the contract was made for their benefit. And so we have the idea of third party rights here, um, but those are perhaps limited um, within particular circumstances. And it's important to look at that section one of the 1999 Act to make sure that you're applying it correctly. So we also have to think about the remedies as well. What happens if someone goes back on their promise or doesn't actually do something? What remedies are available? And again, if you're answering a problem question, this is definitely something where you can pick up a lot of marks. People tend to forget about it and it's relatively easy to do so. Perhaps the most common approach will be to get an injunction against a person because they are either not doing something or they're doing something that they shouldn't be in contravention of a covenant and they'll want the court to basically step in and either make them do something or make them stop doing something. So we have queer timid in injunction, which is basically if you think that someone is about to breach a covenant, you can get the court to step in and make sure that they don't. And um, we can have an injunction to prevent the continued breach of a covenant as well. So while it's going on and also a mandatory injunction as well, which is where you're basically forcing someone to do something and um, making sure that they do something for a positive covenant would be the best example. There are going to be occasions, though, where an injunction is not correct or the correct um, way to uh, achieve a remedy. And these are particularly in the circumstances of Shelfer and City of London Electric Lighting Company. So it might be too burdensome to actually impose an injunction. And so in those circumstances, the court may decide that it's actually more appropriate to give the uh, injured party damages. So it's important to look at that Shelfer case. Um, just to make sure that you know the circumstances, um, but damages are certainly a possibility where an injunction uh, is too onerous or should not apply. Finally, what about if we want to actually get rid of a covenant, and, and I've not really put it on this slide, but also what about if you want to modify a covenant as well? Well, you can go to the Upper Tribunal, the Lands Chamber, under Section 84 of the Law of Property Act, there are four grounds on which you can discharge a covenant. Firstly, the covenant has simply become obsolete. Um, secondly, is a little bit more complicated. So we have the, the idea that continued enforcement of the covenant is firstly obtrusive to a public or a private use of land. It's of no 
pra practical benefit or is contrary to the public interest. And if necessary, then it is comp compensable by money. And um, so we have, go back to that idea of damages and whether that can actually be appropriate in some circumstances. Thirdly, it's quite easy. All those entitled to the benefit consent to the discharge. And finally, the discharge confers no injury on the person benefiting. So if there's not really a benefit there, then they will be absolutely fine with discharging that covenant. So as I mentioned, covenants can actually be a very sort of difficult area and it can become very convoluted, especially if you're dealing with this as part of a problem question. I think that if this does come up as a problem question, you just have to sort of breathe take a minute and write quite a decent plan before you actually start writing your answer properly. So you might want to start by thinking about who are the different people involved. So identifying say the covenantor and the covenantee and thinking about who is making a promise from one person to another. Once you've got that you can start to think about circumstances where the land is changing hands. So perhaps this covenant or that we've got up at the top here sells their land to another person. And so the question is, do, is this new owner of the land, are they still bound by that promise that the original person made? So again, that can apply to the covenantee as well and thinking about whether the benefit is running and whether the new person who owns the land is also able to um, get the benefit as well. Once you've done that and you've got an idea about who the different people are and what their roles are in relation to being a covenantor or a covenantee, whether they've got the benefit or the burden of a covenant, you can start to think about some of those other factors as well. In particular, thinking about whether we're dealing with co um, common law or equity and also thinking about the type of covenant that we're dealing with. Is this a positive covenant where someone is obliged to actively go out and do something like mow a lawn or build houses on a particular piece of land? Or is it a negative covenant where someone has to actually stop doing something or refrain from doing something? Should they not be building on the land? And how does that have a different effect in different circumstances? Well, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. If you did, make sure to leave it a like and subscribe uh, for more videos in the future. If you do have any questions about this area, and I know that it is a little bit complicated, um, make sure to leave those in the comments below and I'll definitely try and get back to you. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.